But our witness today is Martin O'Malley. Commissioner O'Malley was nominated by President Biden in July to lead the Social Security Administration. In December, he was confirmed by the Senate and was sworn into office on December the 20th. I think most people know his background. He was governor of the state of Maryland, two terms, mayor of, of the city of Baltimore for two terms, a member of city council, and also an assistant state's attorney, uh, all uh, exemplary examples of public service uh, prior to becoming commissioner. So commissioner, we're grateful you're here today and I'll turn it over to you and hope that the echo recedes as you speak. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be here. And uh, thank you for your leadership. Thank you uh, for your concern, your compassion for people among us who really need uh, their neighbors to care about them. Uh, I think all of us in this, on your panel would agree that there probably is no more important uh, program our country's ever created that expresses our compassion for our neighbors quite so much as Social Security. And the good news is that for 88 years, uh, this program has operated at a pretty high level, uh, make, lifting a lot of seniors out of poverty, helping people suffering from disabilities. So I, it's my great honor to be able to lead the men and women of this agency forward at a very, very tough time in their history. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, I have been on a learning curve, a steep learning curve for the last 90 days. I have visited all nine regions. I have yet to get to the Wilkes-Barre dock, but that's next on my, my list. And thank you for surfacing the concerns of those hardworking men and women who do such critical work, not just for, you know, in their own region, but for the whole country. But I have done uh, town halls with employees in nine different regions. I did that over 16 days in January. I sat side by side with workers on the co-pilot headset, if you will, in the teleservice centers, set aside, I mean, uh, uh, on the other side of the glass as uh, our frontline workers were interviewing people. And, and the most important two things I learned were these. Number one, there is a deep commitment among not only the senior executive service of Social Security, but throughout the agency, a deep commitment to the mission of this agency. And that, uh, as Sen former Senator Mikulski said to me, is probably the most important asset that I have as the new leader of this agency. The second thing I learned is this, and I saw the symptoms of it very acutely on the front lines. Social Security is now serving more customers than ever before, with fewer staff than they've had in 27 days. And, and it is true that our ability to serve our customers is the intersection of people, process, some policy, uh, and technology. And all of those things come together. Yeah, I was surprised to learn that Social Security now operates on less than 1% of its annual benefit payments. And this operating overhead has effectively been reduced by about 20% just over the last 10 years. In other words, in 2018, when you looked at our overhead as percentage of outlays, it was about 1.2%. In the president's budget, which is a solid step in the right direction, it is uh, uh, a 0.96 of 1%. Uh, so what is the result of that? Um, the result is that we are in a customer service crisis with people waiting on average 38 minutes for the 800 number to uh, agent to answer their call. People with disability waiting nearly eight months on average, some states better than others, uh, but on average eight months for a decision on their initial application and then another seven months for the ALJ uh, if they have to appear at, appeal it to an ALJ hearing. So clearly we can and must do better. And uh, I've been, um, uh, these are some of the things that we are doing about it and already in motion. I have put together an outstanding new command staff at SSA, including uh, Dustin Brown, our chief operating officer, a new CIO, new head of uh, uh, the Office of General Counsel, uh, Carolyn Colvin, former commissioner returning as Commissioner Emerita. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, uh, we are launched within 30 days a new performance management regimen, which we call security stat. So instead of having sort of sleepy 
one-year cadence associated with the budget to make needed process people and performance improvements. We do it every two weeks, every two weeks, every two weeks. For one blessed hour, we locked the whirlwind outside the door and we focused on the data and the maps that tell us whether we're doing a better job or not in serving the people of Indiana or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania or Connecticut. One of those hours exclusively dedicated to field operations. The next one exclusively to the 800 number and so on. We tackle other pressing challenges, including uh, the wait times for initial disability determinations. That's one of the focused hours. One of them is all of those hours is all about fraud. And another one is about the numerous and oftentimes now incomprehensible notices that we send to people. The only part of which they can understand is the last line that says, if you don't understand, call our 800 number and wait for 39 minutes. So, uh, but I wanted to touch um, on one other intense uh, areas of focus that we've been on, and that has to do with the injustices that we have done to our neighbors uh, when it comes to overpayments and underpayments. Many of you probably saw the uh, uh, journalism, te television journalism, the t television journalism piece done by 60 Minutes, highlighting the injustice that we do to Americans when, through no fault of their own, we overpay them and then claw back in a rather brutal and summary way, 100% of, uh, uh, of their check if they don't call us back to work out a payment plan. So Congress and the law requires that we make every recovery of the, every effort to recover those payments, but doing so without regard to the larger purpose of the program can cause grave injustices in individuals, and we have to fix these. So today I'm announcing before your committee, Mr. Chairman, some new reforms. Many of these reforms came from our own employees on the front lines. Uh, first, instead of intercepting 100% of Social Security benefits when a claimant fails to respond to a demand for repayment, we will, that default setting will now be 10% of withholding, which is what it has long been in, um, you know, in, with regard to Title 16. Secondly, we are going to shift the burden away from asking the claimant to prove that they were not at fault instead to a more neutral setting so that the agency has the responsibility of putting forward if they believe that there's some intention uh, on the part of the claimant or some fault. Third, we are going to uh, realign our period for repayment uh, which traditionally had been 36 months, and we're going to realign that to what the Veterans Administration does and allow for a 60-month repayment window. And fourth and finally, for now, we're going to make it easier for overpaid beneficiaries to request a waiver of the repayment. So the American people, in conclusion, work their whole lives to earn the benefits of Social Security, but there's something else they've already worked for, they've already paid for, and they've already earned, and that is a decent level of customer service to access those benefits. And the good news is that if we were allowed once again from the same FICA dollars, which were not paid in a discretionary way in paychecks, if we were allowed to operate on 1.2%, we could restore customer service in all of your states, and we could do it pretty quickly. Uh, the President's budget invests in Social Security for the people of our nation. It includes a 9% increase over what was, uh, we were allowed to spend. I hesitate to say appropriation because we haven't had an appropriations hearing in nine years. But the President's budget includes a 9% increase over what we had last year been allowed to spend for our operating uh, expenses to 15.4 billion. And we look forward to working with you to sustain funding increases so that we can get back to serving the people with the customer service they've already earned, they've already paid for, but they're being denied. And we can do so without adding a penny to the deficit. Thank you very much. Mr. thanks for your opening statement. I'm gonna jump ahead, instead of asking you my question, I'll turn to Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate your taking me out of order for this uh, really very important hearing. Nothing is more vital and important, as you well know, uh, Commissioner O'Malley, than Social Security to Americans, to all Americans, not just recipients, but to their families, to their children, because when they are in poverty, 
their children and their families suffer as well. So I really want to thank you for your attention to improving this system. I have a reform proposal that goes to the levels of benefits, but your focus on customer service certainly is vital. And the overpayments, the shock and brutality of efforts by the government to claw back overpayments is absolutely unacceptable. I hope that you will be doing more, even more than what you've said you would be doing to this committee just now, because this kind of really unfortunate and unfair treatment of Americans when through no fault of their own, they have to suffer the hard hardship of clawbacks and retrievals of payments that are the fault of the government for overpaying. Uh, I want to uh, go to um, another topic that has concerned me because I'm hearing from constituents about the windfall elimination program and government pension offset. Uh, these two provisions are separate, both harmful provisions that reduce Social Security benefits for workers and their eligible family members if the worker receives or is entitled to a pension based on earnings from employment not covered by Social Security. I'm sure you're familiar with these provi provisions that disproportionately affect public service employees, including educators, police officers, mm -hmm. firefighters, and others. I've introduced the Social Security 2100 Act that would repeal these provisions, among other changes that substantially benefit Social Security recipients, giving them cost of living increases, imposing fair burdens on people earning more than $400,000. But what concerns me is, apart from repealing WEP and GPO, is the failure of some local and state governments to disclose the effects of these two provisions on new employees. And I wonder whether you are familiar, whether you've heard information about disclosure of this information the two provisions, the windfall elimination provision and the government pension offset provision, uh, whether you've heard from recipients and claimants about their effect, firefighters, educators, police officers, because the requirement for an offset really ought to be disclosed to people when they come to work. I, I would agree with you, Senator. I'm sure it comes as a great shock to a lot of people who put their lives on the line in public service jobs or, or other jobs to find out as they approach retirement that, uh, they, that that Social Security they thought might be there isn't going to be there. So uh, uh, I've, I've received some briefings on this. Um, uh, it's my understanding that over the years a number of, of states kind of were historically allowed to sort of opt out of requiring FICA payments of, of employees into Social Security. And now the dilemma that you have as policymakers is how do we adjust that moving forward and what are the, what are the you know, equities and, and the costs of uh, addressing that uh, either in a prospective way or in a um, um, more comprehensive way. I don't know entirely what the answer is, but I would be, I would look forward to working with you. And we have excellent actuaries. Uh, the amount of data, the their capacity to project puts and takes into the future is really outstanding. So I would, I would look forward to working with you on that, Senator. Thank you, and uh, I, I really want to thank you for your continuing public service, very distinguished career and uh, your service in this position is as important as any, what any of us do because you touch the lives of so many Americans and uh, I want to extend to you the offer of help on my part and I'm sure my colleagues to help improve this system that uh, is so vital to Americans. Waiting 38, 39 minutes is just intolerable and yes, sir. Uh, not the fault of the hardworking people in the Social Security Administration it's the lack of resources that 
you are provided. So we got to do better. Thank you. Senator, thank you. And we need your help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. We'll turn next to Senator Brown, uh, Senator Ricketts. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner O'Malley, for being here today. Good to see you again, Senator. Yeah, good seeing you. So uh, according to the Social Security Administration, in 2024, roughly 68 million Americans per month will receive a Social Security benefit, which uh, is a total of almost $1.5 trillion over the course of the year. Over 350,000 Nebraskans receive Social Security benefits, with a large majority of these individuals being retired. Many Americans do not know they need to plan for their benefits to be lower than expected due to federal taxes. Social Security began tax, being taxed in 1984, and at that time only about 10% of the beneficiaries were being taxed. Now over 40% of the beneficiaries are being taxed at the federal level. As Governor of Nebraska, I recognize that all Social Security benefits should be completely tax-free, and that's why I worked hard to pass a historic law that would phase out the state income tax on Social Security benefits over a period of time. Due to the success of this Nebraska law, I introduced the Social Security Tax Cut Act once I entered office here in the United States Senate. Under this plan, a typical senior would save about $800 a year on taxes, and this would create real relief for our seniors in a time of rising costs and out of control inflation. By passing this bill, we can take the first step in boosting the retirement income of millions of seniors uh, in Nebraska and across this country. Uh, moving on to the um, issues here, you put forward a path to improve customer service, so thank you very much for providing the data. Uh, I actually expect a governor to want to look at data, so I appreciate that very much, Mr. Uh, Commissioner. And uh, n noted what uh, Senator Blumenthal talked about, the 38-minute on hold time. When I took over as governor of Nebraska in our economic assistance line, that hold time was nearly 24 minutes, so not quite as high, but still not good customer service. And uh, I know you've got also with regard to the time delay on that. I know you're re relatively re uh, new into the job. Can you talk a little bit about what's your plan to be able to address some of these issues with regard to customer service, like the hold time of 38 minutes? And do you have a goal specifically you're shooting for to be able to hit with regard to that hold time and some of the other uh, goals? And uh, just kind of what are the steps you're gonna take to be able to get there? Yes, sir, thank you. Let me. Um let me, uh, let me begin by saying that the most important thing that we could do and the most important thing that we could address is this yawning gap between the ever-rising beneficiaries. That 68 million number that you cited was also what I cited when, during my confirmation just four months ago, but now it's 71 million. So that, that blue number here continues to go up but the staffing is declining now to a 27-year low. Last year we had a spike, but as you might imagine, if one of your employees when you were governor was answering a call after somebody had been on hold for an hour, you know, 39 minutes is the average, they're coming off of that call hot. So our attrition rate in the teleservice centers is about 24%. So many of the people that we hired leave and it's not, a lot of the questions are not simple questions to answer, so they require some, some training. But this is what we're doing specifically on the, on the uh, call times. Uh, we have a number of leading actions, as you know from a performance management sort of governor yourself. Uh, we, there are leading actions that deflect people from the 800 number uh, to address their concerns in more timely, legitimate ways. So everything we can do to drive up the numbers of people that are getting their services online or applying online for a social security card rather than calling the 800 number, those are examples of deflection. Examples of call resolution are things that allow us to answer that call the first time instead of making a person call back or perhaps sometimes process or policy changes that allow the call taker to take an attestation after we've already identified that they are who they are and what their mother's maiden name is and, and those sorts of things so that we can resolve whether they're calling for a tax form or something else so we can resolve that on the first call. There are a host of actions that I, many of them, I experienced and, and learned of firsthand when I was out there sitting side by side with people all over the country. Um, and each of those has an impact on diverting people from the call. I'll give you another one. Uh, lawyers, claim advocates, 
would call the 800 number again, and this is kind of a twofer, this is both deflection and resolution, uh, would call to make sure that their entry of appearance, their 1696 form, was accepted by Social Security. And to be sure, to be sure, they would fax it in, mail it in several times because there was no way for them to check on their own other than to send lots of repeat notices, which is wasteful when you have to do the same one in the same case, or they would call the 800 number. But because the 800 number was so overwhelmed, somebody, well-intentioned, said those lawyers can only check on status of three cases. So we've done two things. One is to make it possible for them online to see whether we've accepted their 1696 entry of appearance form. The second is that if they do happen to call the 800 number, their secretaries are not limited to checking uh, that uh, uh, status on three cases, but they can ask four, five, six, seven, eight, so they're not calling back as soon as they hang up and being on hold again. Those are some of the things we're doing. Uh, we've we've had struggled with an underperforming system, uh, new telephone system that we went into during the pandemic and the closure, you know, the, uh, the shutdown. And that system has not yet performed as it was promised. And uh, we really do struggle with that. Uh, but we also struggle with uh, the attrition rate in our teleservice centers and trying to, you know, continue to provide a level of customer service with less than 1%. You know, all state operates on 22% as a percentage of its outlays, 22% overhead. Uh, excuse me, I think it's 12%. Liberty Biberty, 12%. We are less than 1%, less than 1%. And it shows. In 2018, we were 1.2% and the customer service was better. So there's a lot of bunt hit singles that we're doing on process improvement and performance management, but it won't make up for that yawning gap. Uh, the good news is Congress could address that and it won't affect the deficit because people have already paid for their customer service in the trust fund. And here's the other good news. If we were allowed to operate at 1.2%, not only would it not add to the deficit, but I asked the actuary, how far would it advance the so-called depletion date of 2034? The answer to that is 30 days. So this is kind of a self-inflicted wound. People already paid for their customer service. They already paid for their benefits. There was nothing discretionary on their part about it. <laughs> it was mandatory. And um, uh, we could get back to that very quickly. Yeah. Well, hey, thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner. And, and, and those are all steps that I think demonstrate that you've got the right idea about how we address and providing better customer service for our seniors. I would also just uh, add in there, and we've talked about this, uh, Lean Six Sigma or another in process improvement methodology to look at your processes as well, but you're spot on by looking at the deflection and how we can, again, in my business career and in my career as governor, the, when you can get people to use the online services, it's actually a win-win because once they get used to it, they enjoy it better, it's better customer satisfaction, and it helps you out providing service to people on the 800 number. I would love for you to come up to a security stat meeting. Oh, okay, great. You would, uh, you would enjoy it. It's... You know, what you did as governor, what I did as governor, and the senior executive service has really responded to us. It's every two weeks, every two weeks. Not just looking at the lagging indicators, but at the leading actions that drive us. And uh, there's a lot of Six Sigma principles in there as well. All right, great. We'll follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ricketts. Uh, Commissioner, I want to start on the question of funding. I think the one of the graphics that you, um, one of the, I should say, the, the charts that you included in Part of your material is headline staffing declines as beneficiaries rise. Kind of says it all. But as you, as you made reference to as well in your testimony, the president requested $15.4 billion for the Social Security Administration for fiscal year 2025, which is a nearly 9% increase. For years, the administration, SSA, has cr been chronically underfunded, as I mentioned. Ultimately, this underfunding negatively impacts benefit delivery. Despite this, we've heard extreme proposals from some that Congress should consider cutting Social Security. I'll never support cuts of Social Security. I think that's a fairly widespread view. We know that it's a lifeline for Americans of all walks of life. This is a promise that we have to deliver on. 
and um, I'll continue to work to fulfill that promise. So I have two, two questions, two interrelated questions. How would flat funding, or even worse, a cut or cuts to funding impact the Social Security Administration and ultimately beneficiaries? We are, we are struggling as a, a big human resources organization where what we do is service. We're customer service. Our agents in the 1,210 field offices, the hardworking men and women that process claims the, at the Wilkes-Barre dock, it's all, it's all people. Uh, the technology, granted, some really, really old technology, by the way, uh, still green screens and COBOL uh, and, and at, the, at the base of it, um, this, this puts me in mind of, um, you know, back in governor days, um, Senator, if a school system, which is all, their budget is mostly all teachers in the classrooms, if they have fewer teachers and the number of students is rising, those classrooms are going to be larger. By way of analogy, if our staffing is fewer, our wait times are going to be higher and they're gonna be longer lines. Uh, sometimes when people have really, you know, with really dire needs. So we have to get back, and the president's budget takes a really affirmative step at getting us back to the traditional 1.2% that we operated on prior to 2018, where we had a pretty high level of customer service. Nobody was, uh, you know, and, and it wasn't breaking the bank, and uh, it was something that people had already paid for. Uh, if we were to receive uh, the, the 15.4 billion proposed by the president, that would allow us, we believe, to reduce our uh, 800 number uh, hold times by 20 minutes. Currently 39 on average in the last fiscal year, we believe we can knock 20 minutes off of that. Um, we'd be able to reduce initial disability claim wait times uh, to 215 days and we believe we can reduce the claims backlog by 15%. Uh, another positive step in the right direction the following year would allow us to do even better. Uh, but we've, uh, we now are, are trying to serve the highest number of beneficiaries ever with the lowest staffing we've had in 27 years. And that has not been offset by huge investments in new technology and those sorts of modernization things. 90% of our technology budget goes to keeping old systems functioning rather than doing the, the upgrades that we need to. I wanted to, to move to a second uh, inquiry about um, the employees and morale and, and um, just those basic um, concerns that uh, I think everyone has expressed over a number of years. SSA employees do great work and it just as you mentioned in my home state of Pennsylvania, thousands of payments are processed each month. These payments are for retired workers and their families, people with disabilities, widows, widowers, children. Yet the number of beneficiaries grows and staffing for SSA has hit a 25 year low. And by the end of fiscal year 2024, without any changes, staffing will be at the lowest level since 1972. Increasing workloads with limited staff inevitably results in higher levels of stress and burnout. This is causing problems for workers, applicants, and beneficiaries, leading to higher turnover, backlogs, and delays. SSA is used, used to be ranked one of the best places to work, and now uh, ranks at the bottom. So, Commissioner, you made reference earlier to this, but I wanted to, you to highlight it again or add to it. How are you engaging SSA employees? I know you've had uh, a number of town halls and engagements like that. And what is your kind of broad-based plan to uh, improve staff morale. And I know I'm over, but as soon as the commissioner's done with his answer, I'll go to Ranking Member Braun. Yeah, the, Senator, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. 10 years ago, when we were able to operate on 1.2% of our overhead, we, had, we were rated as the best place in the federal government to work. Now we're dead last. The pressure that's being- We went from best to last. We went from best to last. Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, we've been last for three years in a row. And some people on the Fed survey uh, 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 vote with their feet by not even bothering to fill out the survey again. Uh, I've done nine town halls with employees all across the country, not with set remarks, just more mayoral style, you know. 
Uh, what I've felt and what I've seen out there is a workforce that is exhausted, they're stressed, uh, they are overworked, uh, they, uh, uh, the managers feel this pressure intensely as well. Uh, the sense that people don't care, that their workloads are just getting higher, none of their bosses listen, nobody in Washington listens. Uh, it's, uh, th that morale problem then leads to all sorts of problems affecting the health of the workers, and if the workers aren't healthy, uh, our customers can't, uh, do not receive good service. So here's a few of the things that we're doing. Uh, first and foremost, I've been present and I've been listening. And that actually is important. Some of the people in the town halls have said, you know, we just haven't had a commissioner that we could fuss at for so long. Uh, and some of the problems are things that you've got to believe when you're on the front line that nobody in headquarters cares if they haven't fixed this by now. So we're fixing some of those things. And when we do, we let people know. We had 1,600 employees respond to the Engage survey that we did uh, right off the, the bat. And there's a, one more thing that we're working on, and that has to do with, uh, you know, when people ask for a reasonable accommodation, uh, in, because they have a sick child or they, uh, or they, they have some condition uh, that, that requires that reasonable accommodation, that should not linger and take a, a year to resolve. So we're doing some reforms on that score as well. I meet regularly every month with the Labor Management Council. I encourage the regional commissioners to do the same thing because the best ideas I ever received for improving customer service as a mayor or a governor always came from the people on the front lines doing the work at the MBAs or the other places. Uh, and now we have a system that actually listens to them and implements these changes. I might just cut you off there only because we're over. Yes, sir. I'll go to Ranking Member Braun. I'm going to defer to uh, Senator Scott. All right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ranking Rank Member Braun. Um, Commissioner, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for taking my call. I think all of us probably were dealing with this overpayment issue, and I know you've got uh, you've come up with some proposals so um, to do deal with that. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. So you were we were both governors, and um, Senator Braun's going to be a governor. Um, so when we, you're the governor, you have to sort of solve all the problems. And it sounds like you're really focused on the service problems, which is outstanding that you're doing that. And that's going to make a, you know, if you're able to get that done, it's going to make a diff difference. So thanks for doing that. I just want to talk about just the fact that it goes bankrupt in, uh, in 34. One thing that surprised me is uh, we just got um, President Biden's fourth budget, and there was nothing in the budget that actually protects uh, Social Security from the standpoint of it's, it didn't reduce when it was going to go bankrupt. Uh, there's been nothing in there, which has surprised me. So I can't imagine, I don't know, when you walked in, if you had, um, as governor, you know, I don't know where your pension plan was, but you tried to make sure it was fully funded. So, so aren't you surprised that, that there's nothing in the budget to, to deal with the solvency issue of, of uh, Social Security? Um, when, I was, when I was elected governor, our pension system was very challenged, was facing unsustainable uh, an immediate unsustainable future, and uh, we had to fix that. What people weren't happy about it, uh, but we fixed it. Uh, the uh, the depletion event, as the actuaries call it, to distinguish it from bankruptcy, that is now estimated to be happening in 2034. And that would be the point if you men and women of our Congress don't act as your predecessors did about a month before the last depletion event in 1982, if you don't act, it is true that Social Security uh, would only have 77% of the dollars that it needs to meet full benefits. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not terribly surprised because I, I also know that, uh, I mean, in terms of a, a formal proposal from the president, I know he's been very clear about his policy position, and I also know that he has uh, consistently stated his desire to see those that earn more than $400,000 to start to pay into Social Security again. And I also know from having gone through the confirmation process and met with many of you uh, that there are a lot of ideas out there. 
uh, there are some of your body who told me we should try to do this right now. There are others who said there's no way in the political dynamics of an election year that this can get solved right now. Uh, and we need to do it after the next election. Fortunately, I no longer have a political job, so those calculations are You're going to get it done. <laughs> those calculations are not mine to make. They're yours to make. And, and we have great actuaries. And uh, anything, any way that we can be of help, as you think about this, we would be very responsive and, and able to do so. I, um, I'm sure you didn't read it. I, I proposed a bill that would make sure that we didn't reduce benefits for Medicare and Social Security. And I can't imagine you don't. Without reading the bill, I'm not suggesting you sign off on the bill, but you probably agree with that, right? And we shouldn't be taking people. That's the goal. Away. That's not a hard one, is it? Um, do you support efforts by Congress to use savings generated on programs like Medicare or Social Security to pay for other spending? Well, that's a that that would be a policy call. Uh, do, you, do you think we should do that? I think we should. I think we should do whatever it takes to secure, you know, for the security of the men, women, and children of the nation. As FDR said. Okay. So, um, if you, okay, so I'll give you an easier one. <laughs> the, um, would you allocate 80, would you, if you have to choose, $80 billion for, to the Social Security Trust Fund or $80 billion to add more IRS agents, which one would you, would you choose? Well, again, that's a policy choice. I would advocate, um, I, I, what I would suggest is that you don't even have to choose between the two because people have already paid for the 1.2% we need in customer service and they paid it in their FICA and it's already there. We just need to be allowed to use it out of the trust fund. And if we did, Senator would only advance that depletion event by 30 days. One, one quick question. Um, telework. So you've got, I, I think you, it said you have 55,000 employees. How many people are working in, in office versus working from home? Yeah, it depends on the job and it depends on the function. We, I did make an announcement uh, about uh, adjustments to our telework policies. Can I go into that yeah. as succinctly as I can? And, and, and Commissioner, can you say where, the, where it was before um, COVID and where it is now? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting story uh, to, to, to encapsulate it. At the end of President Obama's administration, he encouraged Social Security to make their workloads, their processing workloads, portable. Uh, it was not because he was prescient and saw that a pandemic was about to shut us down. It was because he wanted to reduce carbon footprint impact on climate and all of those sorts of things. Social Security responded, and they made many of their workloads portable, uh, meaning that they could be done from any place, either at the office or at home. And thank God they did. Uh, uh, when a new administration came in, they put an end to that policy. They said everybody has to work at a work site five days a week. And then about a year later, the pandemic hit, and they said, whoops, everybody go back to work at home. So we've had a lot of whiplash. Ever since the pandemic ended, however, uh, all of the field offices have been open five days a week, nine to five, five days a week. And the employees do three in the office and then two uh, teleworking out of the week. The managers have to manage that. It, uh, and some of their work involves the, what they call adjudication, the follow-up stuff, the processing. It's not all just seeing people through the glass. You gotta process those cases. I made an announcement in February 2nd uh, that uh, I would, of course, be in headquarters uh, five days a week. My command staff, the people in the commissioner's office are four days a week, one day of telework. Everybody else, three days of telework. I'm, just, I'm sorry, three days on site two days of telework, and that also affected all of the headquarters in the nine different regions of SSA. The uh, computer programmers were two and three, two days on site, three of, of telework, and we hope that that's going to be a better and more effective balance. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Senator Scott. We'll turn next to Senator Warnock. And before Senator Warnock's question, um, I'm going to have to be out for a period of time, probably about a half an hour, but between now and then, uh, senators will be able to ask their questions and I'll be back. Um, but I think after Senator Warnock, we'll go to Senator Vance and then Senator Fetterman, uh, and somewhere in between there, Senator Braun will be back and he'll ask his questions. Senator Warnock.
Thank you so very much, Chair Casey, for holding this important hearing. And uh, Commissioner O'Malley, it's great to see you again. Uh, of course, I've known you a long time, first as Mayor O'Malley when I pastored a church in Baltimore. Governor O'Malley and now Commissioner, thank you for your lifelong commitment to service. Yes, My office frequently hears from Georgians uh, about benefit overpayments and subsequent clawbacks. I know you've talked about that in your opening statement, um, but I think it's always important that we center the people as we discuss policy, remember the human face of the issues we talk about. A few years ago, Savannah resident Denise got a letter from the Social Security Administration informing her that she owed the agency $58,000 in overpayments through no fault of her own. Uh, she wasn't aware of it until she got the notice years later. She couldn't afford to pay that amount back and the agency reduced her monthly benefits to the point where she can no longer afford her rent. That, that's the human cost, the human face uh, of these policy issues and issues that need to be resolved. Uh, you said one of your priorities is to address overpayments. And I know you've addressed that to some degree in your opening statement. Uh, but as we think about the question, how does the agency plan to address this systemic issue? If you were to outline, say, the top two or three things uh, that you think about that need to be done right now to begin to resolve this, what, what would those? Yes, sir. The, uh, this, is, this is one of the top, and on January 2nd, I sent uh, now hear this sort of uh, welcome back after the New Year's holiday to the command staff, uh, the senior executive service. I said, we're in a customer service crisis. Our top priorities are the 1-800 number at the time it takes for a disability de de uh, uh, determination. And thirdly, to address the injustice we do to real people who through no fault of their own find themselves in a position of having 100% of their benefits that they live on intercepted until they can make other overpayment arrangements. Uh, before I had even uh, uh, been confirmed, uh, there was an outstanding uh, person assigned to untangle uh, this problem and its impact, as you said, Senator, on real people, and her name is Leanne Strieber. Uh, and she's done an outstanding job to help us do a deep dive and get our heads around what is the universe of people and what are the root causes, and what can we do right now so that our obedience to the congressional mandate that we take actions to recover overpayments when there's been a mistake doesn't run contrary to the whole purpose of the act itself, which is to keep seniors from being you know, put under a bridge through no fault of their own. Uh, so the, the top things that we are doing is Today, I'm able to announce that we are no longer going to have that clawback cruelty of intercepting 100% of a payment if people do not respond uh, w uh, to our notice to call us and work out other uh, terms. The second thing we're going to do is shift the burden from asking the claimant to prove that they didn't contribute to it, instead to a neutral position. If we have reason that says that uh, uh, they were at fault, well, we should have to produce that reason, not them. And then the third thing that we're going to do is, uh, actually two more. Third thing is that just as the VA, when they make mistakes, uh, has a 60 month period to recoup that overpayment, we had been operating on 36 months. We're gonna extend that to 60. And uh, finally, we're going to make it easier for people who uh, have uh, uh, received an overpayment to be able to file for a waiver and, and, and have that uh, issue resolved. And we hope to, we're, we're looking to do more as well. I'm not able to announce that now. I mean, because a lot of this involves training and changes the system so that when people walk into the 1,210 field offices with an overpayment, they're, they're properly managed. But those things will all have a big impact on some of the people uh, who find themselves in the positions like the, the woman who called your office. It's good to hear the, the ways in which you're focused on this and, and we'll remain vigilant alongside you in this effort. Uh, people like Denise and others shouldn't have to be penalized for a situation that they did, did not uh, create. Um, 
I see I have uh, just five seconds, so I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you so very much. Senator, thank you, and for your leadership and friendship through the years. Great. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, it's good to see you, and thanks for your, your service, Commissioner O'Malley. Uh, and I want to thank the, uh, the chair and the ranking member for hosting the committee. Um, you know, I, I think almost all of us in our chamber support Social Security, and we want it to be uh, solvent, healthy for future generations. Uh, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. You know, w one just about wait times. Uh, we've heard from a lot of constituents in the state of Ohio that um, you know, when, when folks are calling the 800 number, uh, they're waiting a lot longer than they used to. Hold time for callers in 2020 was 16 minutes. By 2022, it's 33 minutes. 2023, it's 38 minutes. Uh, that's according to some independent analysis that my staff tracked down. And I. I wonder sort of what's driving that. It seems like a pretty significant increase in wait times from 16 to 38 minutes in just a couple of years. And obviously, you know, that's, that's time, time wasted for a lot of people. Just curious sort of what's driving that or if you have any sense of what's causing it. Yes, sir. There's, uh, the agency started to move to a new integrated phone system shortly before the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, they stopped engines said, whoa, we just need to be able to shut down all the field offices immediately, because a lot of people do call the field offices, sure. where, by the way, the, the answer time ranges between three and five minutes. But they needed to have an 800 number up and going right away, mm -hmm. because they had kind of uh, moved away from the old one that had been operated by AT&T. And that required uh, a lot of shift. And uh, the long and short of it is the 800 system that we have today has never fully lived up to what we were promised, especially when it comes to the business intelligence in the center of that system sure. that allows calls to be shifted, people to remain in line, to allow the sort of things that all of your constituents in, in Ohio would expect from any other 800 number, call back if we're sure. too busy and those things. So we have struggled with that. Additionally, this system has never provided us with the sort of management intelligence or any, that, that allows us to be able to better manage the, the workload, the peak times, uh, and distribute them effectively across our 24 different call centers in different time zones across the country. So, so can I ask, Commissioner, is there a plan to transition away from that 800 number system or to better better bolster it and make it more responsive? Like, how are you guys thinking about responding to the issue? We are, we are open to anything that will alleviate uh, this problem as soon as we, as soon as we can. Sure. I was on the phone just two days ago with the CEO of Verizon uh, who is the company that uh, uh, we contracted with the, uh, for, for this 800 number. And I'm hoping to get some word back from them uh, within the next 24 hours, having in very direct language expressed to them uh, the failure of their business intelligence to deliver as promised. There are other approaches, uh, one of which we are, are using uh, of... Uh, uh, call center as service, and that one it seems to have some promising results. And ultimately, as you can appreciate, where we need to head is to a system with modern customer relations management. So when that person in the telecenter gets a call from Mr. O'Malley, they're able to have the screen in front sure. of them, see what my concerns are, when I called before, not to have to ask me name, address, and social security number, all of those sorts of things. Uh, so uh, uh, those are some of the challenges that we've had. Having said that, at our last security stat meeting, uh, we ha had reduced the call wait time to 31 minutes. Now, it's nothing to write home about, but it's better than sure. 39 it's or better, 30. Better directionally, minutes. sure. Um, so I'm mindful of my, my limited time here, but uh, you know we'd love to, to work with uh, your staff and try to address that issue. If you guys have particular ideas, certainly bring them to us because we'd like to be helpful. Um, and, and with that, I'll, I'll yield back the remainder to the ranking member and appreciate you being here. Thank you, Senator. Senator Fetterman. Governor, yes. good to see you again. 
And I just want to acknowledge you, you enjoyed a very strong bipartisan vote to, to bring you on, correct? Thank you, I yeah. did. And uh, that's a testament to, to your career and how serious you take this job. Thank you. And 25 years ago, I was a graduate student um, at the Kennedy School, and we were tasked with uh, what's a policy analysis exercise. And they, were, they charged us to now um, to evaluate and to implement a, a program to privatize Social Security. And I was like, wow, that's kind of that's crazy. I always thought that uh, Social Security was very sacred. And I turned out to be the only uh, student there to, I wrote things that I refused to entertain this, uh, to put this in, and I argued that we just have to keep this uh, in that kind of position. And they actually gave me a failing uh, mark. And the, one of the notes that I remember, it was, uh, Gene uh, Sperling would fire you. You deserve to be. <laughs> and one of the things we also talked about is that, that Social Security is then the stability of that. And I believe that it is actually very stable as well, too. And uh, people, and it also was clear that some kind of actuarial kinds of adjustments or other kind of minor changes could really extend liquidity for decades. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, yes, sir, it is. I mean, the, it's a, it has been a remarkably simple program in one sense. I don't mean to under... So, I mean, this is like this whole kind of, you know, uh, the sky is falling that it's bankrupt or any kinds of thing like that. It's not incredibly going, stable. Not going bankrupt. At worst, if Congress were unable to act as you had in 1982, there would be a big Ex exactly. depletion event. But exactly. it's not going bankrupt. As long as Americans work, it will, ne it will not go bankrupt. And I agree. So it would just be, you know, it, it's, it's so critical to, to millions and millions of Americans. And it just would be just some small kind of adjustments like that. And then that would tack decades and decades of stability and financial security on that. Yes. As, uh, as does a better performing economy and, and, and more job creation and rising wages. Yeah. And, and that's where we're at. And, and I find it's, it's, it's strange. It almost makes me giggle that... Uh, you know, we had members of, of the other side were more concerned about uh, time calls, uh, uh, but not now that the, their nominee is now discussing about cutting Social Security and things. Now, you wouldn't think that that would be advisable to want to cut that or to explore that kind of a conversation. I, I wouldn't think so. I, I haven't, in my, in my travels through these halls, I haven't met one member that wanted to cut Social Security, and I've met members of both parties that was surprised that we already have cut in terms of customer service, but I think that was unwitting. I haven't talked to a single member that said they believe we should cut Social Security. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm just like you, all across Pennsylvania. I've never run into a senior or a recipient saying, you know what, we're getting too much, and we really need to think about, you know, we could cut back and, and tighten our belt. And, and I just want to acknowledge as well, too, that uh, I would hope that in a bipartisan level that we want to protect that and strengthen it and address it and not turn it into a political football and just address it in ways and making those kinds of relatively minor kinds of changes uh, to allow uh, Social Security to be secured um, and fully f funded for decades and decades down. And even my, uh, one of my professor, Alan Simpson, my Repu Republican from Wyoming, you know, mentioned the it. same thing, that it's going to be, it's often difficult to address that because it's utilized more of as a political football. And is that a same statement, too? Would you agree with that? I, I was smiling only because I remember Alan Simpson, and, I'm, um, uh, and he always makes me smile. Um, the, it can, Love that guy. The, the, challenges, the challenges that face Social Security in terms of uh, uh, longer-term solvency are are things that this Congress certainly has the ability to address. And um, the, the good news is that this program has the support of 80% of the American people even in a time of pretty polarized politics. So that's an enormous consensus for, for extending it. Yeah, and I, you know, if 80% of Americans support that, I'm willing to bet that it's 99.999% of people that are recipients that support this, this program as well too. And, and millions de depend on that. So, and again, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Senator. We've had a lot of talk about what to do with Social Security. I think you made a clear statement, no one wants to uh, cut benefits. 
uh, let's go to the other end to make it solvent. Uh, what do you do? Uh, talk about the impact. Uh, how much would we need to keep it solvent for as far out as, as you can see? Because it does actuarially go broke here before we know it. Uh, it's 2034, I think. Is that? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So what, be specific on what it's going to take to make it solvent. And when I said yes, sir, let me be uh, very clear. Uh, the... It, it doesn't, it's not projected to go broke. It's not it's ever when you have to when you have to cut benefits. And I yes, think you sir. said 23% yes. when that occurs. Yes, so sir. That to the, avoid that. To, to avoid, avoid that. the 20, the 23% cut, yeah. which is currently scheduled in 2034, Congress would need to make some changes uh, in order to extend it. Would you be specific on what that would be so we can hear it? Uh, sure. You're, you're going to know the numbers or should. Yeah, yes, sir. The... Um, uh, well, the president has proposed uh, having people, once they make $400,000, pay again uh, into Social Security. What percentage would that be if that uh, group started paying? What would they have to pay into? What percentage of that income would it be to get it solvent? Uh, uh, Senator, I, I, I came here mostly prepared to talk about the customer service things. Yep. So, uh, well, you can get back to me on that. And sure. then, is there any other tool in addition to uh, just paying more yeah. into the system? I tell you, one of the uh, one of your colleagues, Senator Cassidy from Louisiana, talks about different dials on the actuarial stuff, and I'm I'm certainly willing to dive deep and go into that with any member that wants to. The person better able to do that is our actuary, Steve Goss. And, uh, uh, but anyway, back to the call of your question. Uh, on, those, um, on those various dials, you know, members of, of this body have been putting forward bills. Some people suggest that you should count not only the earned income, but you should also count investment income uh, as, as part of that. Some have proposed uh, that there should be, that people should start paying into Social Security, not just when they hit 400000 on the year, but 250000 on the year. So those are the policy decisions, or as Senator Cassidy, your colleague from Louisiana, says, those are the dials uh, that can be considered. Here's something I learned that I did not know before when I asked about the depletion event last time. I said, what did they get wrong? How is it? that Tip O'Neill, Ronald Reagan, Howard Baker, and all these smart people and the actuaries thought that they were creating 75 years of, uh, of uh, adequate funding, even accounting for the baby boomers. I said, did you not know that the people my age had been born? He said, no, we knew all of that. That was calculated. There were two things we missed. Uh, uh, Steve Goss told me they missed the duration and the depth of the recession. They probably should have calculated in a longer recession. The other thing they missed was that changes to the tax code that happened after their bipartisan fix in 1982, which, by the way, only happened about a month before the depletion event, because uh, human beings work against deadlines, I suppose. He said what they didn't calculate was that changes to the tax code uh, would move a lot of the earned income out of that bracket that they were asked to set, they were asked, set it at 90%. So 90% of earned income in America, you pay your Social Security FICA on. They set it at that in 1982, but over the course of time, it shrank to just 82% because of the concentration of wealth among the highest 3 or 4% of earners took it out of that. So those are the two reasons why it was moved up from 2050 to 2034, but it can be moved out again. So raising revenue, a variety of ways uh, might be done. Uh, what about the concept of means testing? Do you have an opinion on that? I think one of the, one of the beauties of Social Security is that um, uh, everybody that pays in receives a benefit. Uh, I think we've... Uh, I would... Uh, Again, you know, I, I have to, like, do a double pump on this because I'm no longer running for office. <laughs> I will never run for office again. So this is not a – these policy calls are not my calls. They're yours. Uh, so let's go to another one that is probably – it's inherent in almost any federal program. I've weighed in the loudest on Medicare. Uh, $60 billion a year 
in fraud in a program that's as dear as what Social Security would be. Uh, last year alone, I think it was 2.7 billion on urinary catheters. I can't imagine how there could be that much fraud on one item, but that's part of 60 billion. What is the figure of fraud that would be part of Social Security and beyond fraud, how, what percentage would there be there of uh, payments made to the wrong beneficiary uh, for the wrong amount? Uh, where, tell us a little bit about that. Yes, sir. There was a big article, there was a front page article in the New York Times, in fact, just last weekend about fraud and about people uh, uh, hacking into our system, using false identities, in essence, taking over your my SSA Is account. there a number out there that Yeah, the you're... number in this article based on a GAO report said it was approximately $34 million, I believe, over the last three years. And $34 million? $34 million by this particular type of fraud. The, the larger number, there have been some GAO reports I don't have in front of me that looks at fraud uh, across the board of agencies. But in this particular instance of people hacking in, using fake identities and diverting payments. It was 34 million over the last three years, and we believe that we stopped 23 million of that. Uh, of the eight meetings we have in regular rotation for uh, security stat, one of them senators exclusively focused on fraud, upping our game, getting inside the turning radius of the bad guys and the fraudsters. And I'm glad to be able to report to you that seated at that table, and by the way, it's the only one we close to the public for obvious reasons, seated at that table is our independent office of inspector general because her feedback without diminishing her independence is really important to us. To that catheter case, uh, it, when I read that one about it's in astounding. the Medicare context, yeah, it was, uh, I thought to myself, did, was nobody mapping this? So we are greatly dialing up our geospatial, our ability to recognize anomalies on the map. Uh, I would like your office to get back to kind of a categorize to the best of your ability to do it, how much fraud would be a part of uh, Social Security. It was an alarming amount in terms of what it was for Medicare. And uh, several of us are weighing in on that. And that's arguably a, a benefit that could be fixed in many other ways, like trying to reform health care by making it more competitive. I right. see ways that you can do it to where you're not up against the actuarial table like you are with Social Security, but we hear about fraud in so many different ways, just like when we did the extended unemployment benefits. Somehow uh, you have reports of uh, $50 billion to $150 billion being mm -hmm. swiped in a, in a special program. We can't take that here when we're running now $2 trillion deficits. So, and Social Security is the biggest program we got out there. Yes, sir. I will, uh, I will be glad to get back to you with an overview. I was flipping through my folder here to the last fraud stat, uh, uh, but I will be glad to get back to you with kind if of you a, would. A, a high level view of what the most uh, common types of fraud is and the amount that we believe we're yeah, losing because yeah, of it. I ran a business for 37 years, and if we ever had any kind of irregularities that would have been in the category of what you of hear the here, here. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, somebody's somebody gets fired, you, you either fix it immediately, but mostly there would have been some type of uh, awareness that you couldn't do it in the first place. And uh, if it does get to be part and parcel of a company, you know, they pay the price big time. And not to mention there might be liability involved to boot. Um, here was something that struck me. It was on e-signatures, which is an efficiency tool. You can do it almost in anything. It was part of a Biden directory, a directive shortly after he got elected, which would have been in 21. Uh, Chairman Casey and I had to write a letter to the Social Security Administration. We did that back on December 13th. And ironically, we did hear today uh, from the Social Security Administration. It wasn't, that, it wasn't ironic, it was causal. Okay, so stuff like that, that's low hanging fruit. And I imagine being a governor, uh, I know for me, coming from the real world of running a business, some of this stuff is just uh, astounding that it can happen. 
And your general opinion, uh, why aren't we being alert to stuff that would get caught in a split second in other places, state governments, uh, the private sector? How can we be in a place where, like for Medicare, for instance, you can have a figure of $60 billion in fraud? And uh, I know billions are now kind of chump change, but that's still a big figure. That's a huge figure. The, uh, uh, let, me, let me say on the letter, I apologize for the amount of time that it took yeah. to get back to you on e-signature. Uh, Social Security has been a, 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 a bit behind in uh, making it, in joining the world where e-signatures are, you know, a common way of doing business. We're making some substantial progress. The initial letters and drafts I saw back to you, I, I didn't think were sufficiently responsive to the question. And I think that'd so be I'm, a good I'm, way to put it. So I made them de dig deeper, and it's a much better, I think you see in there, and with the pie chart, uh, and I was just on the phone with the IRS commissioner or texting him earlier today about a, a remaining uh, item that we need his help on in order to allow us to do attestations rather than signatures. So we've been doing more e-signatures. We're making progress to that and also removing requirements that just no longer make any sense for uh, uh, actual signatures when we can do that stuff over the phone. I think this is the thing that most people miss when it comes to waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, I, I remember after the attacks of 9-11, I was talking to a national security uh, professional about how we miss things. And he said, you know, Governor, I'm mean, sorry, Mayor. He said, you know, Mayor, if we only knew what we already knew and did something about it. When I was, when I was Mayor, we started doing something that hadn't been done before. We asked, can you show me all of the top earners of overtime and all of the top users of six time? And could you rank them from greatest to least? I mean, we couldn't do that in public. There were individual people. And they said, you, you want what? I said, I want you to rank. I mean, things like that that have never been done or in ambulance runs. What are the addresses that we go to like time and time and again? That's just common why? sense. Uh, you're, you're really forced to do that as a mayor because if you're letting stuff like that go, people will run you down at a ball game or some other place. Uh, you're going to be held accountable. Here, I'm worried about the fact that we've lost that. And one other, Chairman Casey's going to be back shortly. We were going to take a short recess. We may still do that till 11.30, but WEP GPO, mm -hmm. uh, that's a, to fix it, it's about an $18 billion a year fix, $180 billion over 10 years. Uh, that's got an inherent unfairness to it in the way that's kind of come down. Sadly, we're in a position where that'd be difficult to fix due to the fact we're borrowing a couple trillion dollars each year, but the overpayment part of it, if there's one thing uh, that I'd try to get to the bottom of right away, it would be to fix that. Because uh, you mentioned it earlier, I think, in your opening statement, and I'd rather than just give a pass on that because they're already dealing with the unfairness of not feeling that they're getting benefits that are equal to what others are, is what can we do to prevent the overpayments in the first place uh, rather than forgiving them once they occur are either trying to clawing them back, which is insult on top of injury. Right. The, uh, we've done a lot of um, unpacking of, of this to figure out what the leading causes are, uh, both in Title 16 SSI, where it's, you know, the leading causes, the financial accounts, wages, income support, and maintenance. In Title II, the retirees and, and disabled, it's relationship and dependency is the uh, leading cause, substantial uh, gainful activity. Uh, in other words, earning above uh, that is a, another one. And computations, I suppose, is the larger bucket where the WEP uh, 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 calculations would fall. The reasons we discover these things have to do with the annual, you know, the annual earning uh, adjustments. And frankly, uh, not to sound like a broken record, when you have fewer staff, sadly, it takes us longer to catch up with the overpayments and do the notices and address them than it might have before. So that's a part of this. Uh, we are putting forward, we just put forward regs on, uh, not exactly related to WEP, but we did put forward regs on uh, uh, the uh, payroll information exchange. So our ability with a large national company like Equifax to be able in a data solution 
to immediately be able to identify when you know uh, a person's uh, uh, earnings. Uh, so hopefully that will mitigate some of these overpayment problems. I think that would be an important one. And then the, probably the most basic thing for anybody that's offering a service of some sort. Uh, I know in our business, if a phone call went over a minute, uh, we felt that was a phone call maybe lost to a competitor. Since right. there's not competition in this case, if you got the cost up to, you, I think you said 1.2 percent yeah. from where it is currently, uh, what would that do in terms of fixing hold time? Because that is probably the most symbolic f uh, feature of dysfunctional government is when you're having to burn a half an hour to just have a phone conversation. Yes, sir. Uh, we believe that um, with the with the president's budget of 15.4 billion, we believe that we can reduce our 800 number uh, that wait time by 20 minutes. I believe that we could get it down even further. Uh, in fact, in a little four pager I provided with you, uh, we um, we believe that uh, if we were able to operate again like we always had before 2018 at 1.2% overhead, we could get that down to five minutes. In the field offices, it is three to five minutes, if you can find the field office or your nearest field office phone. But on the 800 number, if we were op able to operate on 1.2%, we believe we could get that wait time down to five minutes. And in the real world, that standard would be whenever you're over a minute, mm -hmm. the call goes somewhere else. And in our case, it would be to a competitor uh, where you pay that ultimate price. That's why you figure out how not to let that happen. So government, you know where it's gone to. It's got to get back down into where people for yeah. basic questions in any government agency don't have to hang on to the phone more than a few minutes at the most. Yes, sir. And it's a trust. I mean, our expectations, our consumer expectations also apply to our government. And if we can't do the basics of answering the phone, it's hard for people to trust us on larger things like their retirement or the solvency fix that you all have to do in a bipartisan way. I'd like to believe that as we fix the very immediately and fixable customer service crisis, that that'll put some more oxygen of trust in the room for you men and women when it comes to the longer term solvency. We're blessed with a lot of time and we're almost to the point where we're gonna recess anyway. I'm gonna venture on to a different subject. Uh, Mayor, Governor, um, you know how it works in jobs like that. Uh, currently, our biggest issue is not just Social Security, it's Medicare, it's Medicaid, it's the fact that we're borrowing 30 cents on every dollar that we spend currently. We've never in the history of the country raised more than roughly 18% of our GDP in federal revenues. High tax rates, you flush a little more into the treasury, economic growth goes down a little bit. Cut taxes, you take a little bit away from the treasury, economic growth goes up. Given the fact that we've got 50 years of data that this place can't pay for more than 18% of itself of the GDP, and we're currently at 25%, what kind of uh, confidence does that give you that the entirety of it with Social Security at the centerpiece is going to be there for future generations. Well, the, the good news about Social Security is it doesn't contribute to the deficit. So that's why, you know, the ability to, to close this yawning gap between the declining staff and the rising beneficiaries, the dollars are already there to do it, and it doesn't contribute to the deficit. People have already paid it in their FICA. Some of those it other would though at some point if you were at the uh, point of cutting benefits or borrowing money or having to do it through the general fund. Uh, would you agree with well, that? Well, that is true, and yeah. it would also be true that if I would that I would imagine any fix to the web would require the infusion of general yeah. funds. But the good news on answering the phone calls and getting people's disability determinations done before they die. That we could do with 1.2% and it won't add to the deficit. You would think. I'd call that low-hanging fruit. Yes, sir. <laughs> we need your help picking that fruit. Well, I think we'll have a short recess until the chairman gets back. Okay, give you a breather. Oh, sure. Thank you, Senator. I know that um, Ranking Member Braun just finished, I guess, a couple of minutes ago. So, Commissioner, I'll be, I'll be the last questioner. 
unless, unless we have someone else who might, we're good, okay. Um, I wanted to, to, to go back to an issue that you've made reference to, and I appreciate your, your um, comments about this, um, the issue of overpayments. In December, as I made reference to earlier, my staff in Pennsylvania had 78 open cases with constituents that needed help responding to uh, SSA overpayment notice. I sent a letter with Senators Wyden and Brown requesting information about overpayments that were linked to COVID-19 uh, checks, which, as you know, should be held uh, harmless when calculating asset and income limits. And I'm grateful today for your announcement on the changes you're planning to make to respond to overpayments. It's uh, very important that the, the burden is lifted uh, off of beneficiaries. That's a heavy burden, as you know. At the same time, we should be working to prevent overpayments in the future, and as well as underpayments, and to ease the challenges facing both workers and beneficiaries. So here's the question. How do you plan to communicate these policy changes to both SSA employees as well as to beneficiaries? Uh, we'll be doing so uh, in a number of different ways. I mean, first of all, thank you for holding this hearing. As you know, it's been nine years since Social Security's even had a, a budget or appropriations hearing. So your attention to this issue, your concern for people all across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and, and these real life stories is, uh, is also communication. Uh, we will be doing a lot of calls with managers. In fact, I was on one yesterday with 3,075 managers as Leanne Strever was walking her, them through the research, the hows and the whys so they could understand uh, how to implement these new policies. Uh, 60 Minutes was in a way, uh, as awful as that was for many of us to watch, uh, especially those of us in the agency. Uh, they did us a, they, uh, that was communications. I mean, we might be accurate 98% of the time, but in an agency this large, when you're wrong in 2% of the time, that can create a lot of damage, uh, especially if you're one of those people that thought, maybe didn't see the notice, accidentally threw it out in the mail, maybe thought it was a scam. So we're going to be doing four things right away, and we're going to look to do others. One of them is we're no longer going to do that uh, brutal sort of 100% clawback of uh, beneficiaries' uh, benefits. Second, we're going to shift the burden of proof. Uh, if the agency has reason to believe the claimant was in fault, we should put forward that proof and not ask the claimant to do it. Uh, third, we're going to allow repayment plans as the VA does, and sometimes they make mistakes too, uh, of 60 month period of time rather than the 36 which we had been and finally we're going to make it easier for overpaid beneficiaries to request a waiver of that payment because the Social Security Administration uh, you have empowered it Congress has empowered it to be able to waive certain payments if they defeat the purpose of the act namely if it puts an elderly person out of their home, uh, that would certainly defeat the purpose of the act, or if it uh, uh, is contrary to equity and good conscience. So we look forward to putting forth other guidance to the field in order to allow these decisions to be made in a much more immediate, human, compassionate, face-to-face -face interaction in the field rather than allowing it to, to linger for months and months until we catch up with it. Uh, but, uh, but let's also be very clear that part of the reason for the growing, we haven't seen, this is interesting, in the, in the research and the unpacking that we did, we have not seen greater numbers of people affected by overpayments but we've seen the amount of those overpayments go up as our staffing has declined, which kind of makes sense. If it takes us longer to catch it, that's going to be more months that tick up, which creates an even greater hardship for somebody that's living, you know, on their monthly benefit one month to the next. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of a beneficiary, how, will the, how and when would they receive information about these new these changes? We're going to be changing our notices. Uh, so that, that's, um, our notices are, our notices across the board are hard to understand. They're not exactly plain language. It's like mad libs designed by mad lawyers. 
I mean, there's all sorts of language that's hard to track. So uh, th that's the most important thing we can do is the clarity of the language uh, in the notice uh, to people. And um, uh, that's the primary means. It's interesting also, uh, I found it interesting that 92% of people actually go to the trouble to sit on hold for 39 minutes in order to repay mm -hmm. and work out a payment plan. Uh, and I've listened on the other side of some of those calls when people say, look, I told you I'd do 200 a month, I can only afford 100. And our people have the ability to make those adjustments. But the notices is probably going to be the primary way that we improve communication to people. So they would see that when? Uh, they, the, the, the new notices, uh, if memory serves me correctly, within the, we need a couple of months in order to effectuate uh, the change to the notices. Uh -huh. However, in the meantime, we are, are doing a uh, kind of a, a manual workaround uh, of, of for, um, uh, for notices, especially in those, in, I mean, for overpayments, especially in those instances where it has defaulted because of a lack of response to that 100% intercept. We're taking those out and tending to them manually. Um, and we're also doing something else. So this, this ordeal uh, has uh, allowed us to see, you know, to be able to, to better analyze and parse this data to focus on those instances also where there's huge amounts owed by a very tiny number of people uh, that we can also uh, address. Now some of those, if it was involved fraud, we're not going to address. But those that were no fault, we will and do so more quickly. And if there's, is there any way to expedite that from a few months? <laughs> you should have heard what they initially told me. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> the, uh, we're, we're, we're expediting. Uh, so a few the, months is? Yes, there's a number of, there's the 12, there's the training and there's the changes that have to happen in the uh, uh, 1,210 field offices <laughs> for some of this. There's also the mm -hmm. processing centers. There's also the separate sort of debt management people. Uh, the, the, the notices are, are difficult given the legacy systems, but they are moving fast. And uh, the manual workaround that we're going to do immediately was because of that delay. Uh, uh, I was not going to wait while, you know, and have seniors suffer hardship, uh, and, and not to mention all of the anxiety and the other emotional trauma while we you know, untangle our notice issues. So those are going to be done immediately and through a manual workaround. I wanted to move to uh, another issue relating to communications. It's um, challenges within the, the agency. Uh, there's, um, and none of this is new to you, but there's often confusion and inconsistency when it comes to eligibility, service, delivery rules among both um, uh, beneficiaries and employees. Ranking Member Broaden and I sent a letter to you in December regarding the acceptance of e-signatures, and we appreciate your, your response for that. E-signatures should be accepted on most documents, but I've heard from legal advocates that SSA frequently rejects e-signatures and requests physical signatures, which is an unnecessary hurdle for many beneficiaries that may prevent them from accessing benefits. I know that updating procedures and manuals and retraining SSA staff who interact with beneficiaries is time consuming as you just made reference to in terms of trying to expedite things. But keeping funding and the resulting uh, staffing challenges in mind, I, I want to discuss some of the ways you plan to improve communications between employees and uh, beneficiaries. So how would you address the need for ongoing training to ensure accurate information is being delivered uh, to beneficiaries? Just on the training question. Yes, sir. As I traveled all around the country, I, I shared with you earlier, and, and let me apologize for the length of time it took to get back to you on the e-signature. The initial drafts I saw were not responsive, at least to what I would consider to be responsive. So uh, I insisted that we get back to you in a more substantive way. And I hope through that pie chart, you see we've made substantial progress. More is imminent. And then there are some of those red parts of it that, um, uh, that uh, you know, part of this is not only allowing electronic signature, part of it is realizing those places where we don't need a signature at all and it can be done with attestation <laughs> over the phone. 
But let me, get, let me go to training. As I did uh, employee town halls all across the country, Senator, you would have thought that um, uh, in, when I was in San Francisco, you would have thought somebody had put a banner outside that said SSA town hall about our poor training. Uh, our training really took a hit when we went remote in the recession. And the agency has not recovered from that trauma. There was a time when we did training really well. It was also the same time that we had the top morale and there was an esprit de corps, people, young people coming in, learning complex jobs like benefits administrator had people on the floor next to them, present there at the office that they could turn to as any of us have. And if, if, if in, I certainly did as a young lawyer in my profession, you, Good to turn to older lawyers and ask them how to do this. So a lot of that fell by the wayside. And then with the rising beneficiaries and the declining staff, uh, many of the most experienced people were told, well, that training stuff is all great, but there's all these people in waiting lines outside the door. We got to handle these people. It. So we cannibalized our own training in order to throw it at the customer service crisis and the larger and ever rising numbers of customers. One of the lessons I believe we've learned from last year's uh, uh, hiring uh, uh, that we were able to do, thanks to the better budget that you supported, uh, we hired a lot of people, but we lost a lot of them in the first year. And if we are able uh, to start to hire again, and keep in mind right now we're in a freeze, a general freeze. Um, if we are allowed, if you should be able uh, to, uh, to pass the president's budget, which would be a huge step in the right direction, we absolutely have to dedicate those trainers to training and not cave into the temptation to pull them off of that training to throw them at the incoming through the door, the incoming customers through the door. Uh, this agency, that what do the consultants call it, does workforce optimization like all the time. You and I would call it whack-a-mole. We're always shifting people from one thing to another to deal with the latest spike and the latest backlog and the urgent problem. Uh, we, need to, we need to have dedicated trainers, and their job is to train. They're the best at it. And we have to be patient enough to realize that after that six months with that cohort of 30 new hires, those 30 are going to more than make up for the productivity so-called lost by having the trainer not in the front window. So ultimately it does, it is a, an outgrowth of the, the funding and resource issues. There's a, so many of these things, the time, you know, the greater amount of those overpayments Ultimately, a root cause is, yes, antiquated technology, uh, but also a lack of staffing, and the same thing with the training. We cannibalize. We've been, we're, we're trying to serve more people than have ever come, been coming through our doors or our phones with fewer staff than we've had in 27 years. And uh, for, all of the, for all of the clever tricks and you know, process improvements and those things, you know, those are singles. Only Congress can hit the home run of restoring us to 1.2% funding again, like we had every year before 2018. You know, you made reference earlier to technology. Um, we, we all have stories about government agencies at all levels that, that uh, didn't have the technology they needed to tackle big problems. And um, it's alarming for a lot of Americans to hear about the how antiquated the technology is in so many agencies, including SSA. Tell me about that challenge and what you think you can do about it with existing resources or not, um, but what you hope to be able to do with uh, more resources, just on technology alone. Yes, sir. The, it, it is amazing how much data the Social Security Administration has collected on all of us from our very first paycheck. Uh, it is phenomenal. It is also phenomenal that it continues to operate even though the core and the base of it is very ancient COBOL green screen IBM technology. It's a, it's a bit like uh, the layers of Jerusalem built upon each. Uh, and there are a lot of clever people in the fields that have some background in coding and product and, and the, the technology uh, term of that word product. Uh, and they've built some clever things. Uh, 
I, uh, in Birmingham, there was a, a tool that was developed locally there that takes the average processing time for a Medicare-only application uh, that would take a technician usually eight minutes to do, and they automated that on an Excel spreadsheet. And they're able to do it in seven seconds. You multiply that out over a big agency, 40 work years saved and that sort of thing. Uh, when it comes to going through now really voluminous medical records and what we call Section F, the part of the disability uh, uh, case folder, um, we have developed a tool called Imagine. And Imagine allows, uh, is a, is allows the, uh, uh, the technician, the dis or rather the person making the disability determination, it alerts them to what page of those thousand pages the real meat of the uh, you know, listing is, or the doctor's uh, evaluation is, is even able to compare it to past cases to say this one has 80% likelihood of being allowed compared to past cases. So there's some, there's some really, uh, the innovation is happening. Uh, most, a lot of it happens out in the field. When it comes to the larger things, we've got to get out of this straitjacket, that of our uh, technology budget, 90% of it goes to maintenance of those ancient systems, and only 10% goes to developing new systems or what you and I would call modernization. So uh, other agencies, particularly the VA, I think the VA has three times our technology budget, even though we serve, I do believe, more veterans than the VA does. Uh, so. Uh, we, we, it's people, it's process, it's technology, and uh, we have been short staff on all of those, uh, or short funded on all of those. I misspoke earlier when I was talking about our comparison mm -hmm. to other uh, insurance agencies, looking at our budget as a percentage of outlays. It was, uh, all state was actually 19.4% is their overhead to benefits. Uh, Liberty Mutual is 22.8%, I'm sorry, 23.6%. Social Security, traditionally, had been 1.2, we're below 1. Uh, without increasing the deficit, if we were allowed to operate again at 1.2%, we could bring customer service back. And, uh, and the good news is people have already paid for it. I want to move to my last question. <clears throat> With this committee historically has focused on frauds and scams and issues uh, an annual report uh, to, to educate folks around the country about the newest scam and the newest iteration of, of that fraudulent behavior. And um, I think it's one of the best things this committee does every year to be able to update that. And every, every time you think you've learned um, everything about what the bad guys are doing, they invent some, some other scheme. We know that um, older adults are at particular risk for uh, social security scam. Identity theft um, is an issue, of course, that affects our, everyone in, in the country. Recently, my office engaged with a mother from Delaware County, Pennsylvania, as you know, right near Philadelphia, whose infant daughter's social security card was lost in the mail and um, this, this um, family now regularly, I should say the, this, this mother now regularly monitors her daughter's credit card, or credit I should say, to ensure that no one is using her social security number. I've co-sponsored the Social Security Child Protection Act which would require SSA to issue new social security numbers to children under the age of 14 if, if, their cards were lost or stolen. How is SSA supporting individuals whose cards have been stolen? And what other steps has the agency taken to prevent identity theft? Well, Senator, there's, uh, there's um, identity theft is one of the leading causes of fraud, as you know, when it comes to people uh, stealing Social Security benefits. There was an article in the New York Times that um, uh, happened just last week. Uh, the, the, the challenge in all fraud cases is staying inside the turning radius of the bad guys. They're always changing, they're always adjusting, they're always coming up with new tactics and strategies. Uh, and we need to become more nimble than the bad guys. And that's what we are endeavoring to do. 
uh, at Social Security. Um, the, uh, the, the challenge we face as a customer-facing agency is that we want people to be able to access their benefits. We want them to be able to go online, but we also need to make sure that their identity is confirmed that they are the people going online. NIST, I understand, has recommendations for standards that every agency needs to make, uh, and yet every agency is making those trade-offs about making sure that it's good for the consumer and that it can be used, as indeed banks do. Uh, the banks are probably better and more nimble than we are at this, at this point. We need to learn from them, and that's why every two weeks in fraud stat, we lock the door. It's the only one that's not public. And with the OIG's people there at the table with us, we look at all sorts of methods and tactics and strategies and ask ourselves, are we doing any better than we were before at detecting and preventing this? Uh, it has been the agencies, uh, there, it, I, I've heard it said that, uh, that there are uh, huge numbers of social security numbers that are available on the you know, on the black market. And the agency has been very loath to issue new security cards, but I certainly um, would look forward to working with you, especially where children are concerned, because I'm not sure that the rationale of somehow messing up your earnings by giving a six-year-old a new card are really in play here. I appreciate that. And Commissioner, I know we're, we're tight on time, and I know you've all been patient and you've been patient with our um, fluctuating schedules. <laughs> so we're grateful for that. I'll, I'll just make some closing comments and we'll wrap up. As we heard from the commissioner today, the services provided by the Social Security Administration touch the lives of every single American. Social Security is the most successful anti-poverty program to date. The benefits from this program allow tens of millions of Americans, including older adults, people with disabilities, and children to live with dignity. We should be protecting and strengthening Social Security for those receiving benefits today and for future generations. And we should not be talking about cuts, as so many around here seem to uh, talk about year after year. I'm in introducing the Boosting Benefits and COLAs for Seniors Act, so adults can receive the benefit increases that they need. Apart from strengthening benefits, the Social Security Administration needs additional funding, and I think that's an understatement, to support agency operations. This is absolutely critical. The Social Security Administration has been starved of resources, negatively impacting both employer morale as well as customer service. So you can't, as a politician, gripe about customer service, but don't support the funding for Social Security. You can't blow hot air about what government's not doing and then not support the funding. When you do that, you lack integrity. Uh, you gotta, you're, th you're throwing sand in the eyes of the people. Uh, you're trying to confuse them. If, if you want the service to be better, gotta support the funding. I say that to my fellow senators, all 99. For years, this administration, the Social Security Administration, has lacked the leadership necessary to keep the agency on track and accountable to the promises that we've made and the basic promise we've made to the American people. I think Commissioner O'Malley has been a breath of fresh air uh, with his leadership, his experience, and his determination to make change. I was glad to hear that Commissioner O'Malley has been visiting dedicated workers in field offices across the country, engaging with both unions and advocates his hands-on, all-in approach is something we didn't have in the previous administration. That is also an understatement. I won't elaborate. We must ensure that SSA workers are supported so they can provide the high-quality service Americans deserve. So I look forward to working with Commissioner O'Malley on a whole host of fronts, but in particular to reduce wait times, to improve customer service, and address overpayments. Ranking Member Braun will submit um, uh, closing remarks for the record. I want to thank Commissioner O'Malley for his time today and for his public service. His willing to step up and serve again after serving so um, 
in such a distinguished fashion uh, in his previous roles in public service. For the record, if any senators have additional questions for Commissioner O'Malley or statements to be added, uh, the hearing record will be open until Wednesday, March 27th. Thank you all for participating. We're adjourned.